Live from Boston, my name is Emilio Madrigal, and today is Tuesday, April 27, 2021, and I am remotely joined by my good friend and colleague, Rafat Manan. Today, we continue our GYN OB podcast series. Uh, this is the 13th lecture of this series, and it's being presented by Dr. Mary Kinlock, who's an associate professor at the University of Saskatchewan. The title of her talk is Non-Squamous Lesions of the Vulva. And as always, please feel free to post comments and questions in the Facebook and YouTube chat windows, and we'll make sure to pass those along to Dr. Kinlock at the end of the lecture. So with that, I will turn the microphone over to Dr. Kinlock. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Emilio and Rafat, for inviting me to come and discuss non-squamous lesions of the vulva. Welcome to from wherever you're joining us from. Um, I am in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan um, at the University of Saskatchewan. And if you're not sure where that is, which most people aren't, or they've been in a over top of it flying from one place to another, it is directly in the middle of North America. And it is oppressively cold for most of the year and then breathtakingly beautiful for about five months of the year with our slogan is land of the living skies. So it's a beautiful place to be. And today we're gonna discuss um, some non squamous lesions of the vulva, which is kind of a difficult topic to um, break down into an outline, but we did our best here. So we're gonna discuss some cutaneous adnexal uh, diagnoses and then some pigmented diagnoses. And then there's a couple that I couldn't really fit into a category. So we're just going to call them miscellaneous. And we're starting out with the Bartholin's gland, which is a component of the lateral entritis here. And it is bilateral and its main function is to secrete and lubricate the vagina. So you can see it's meant to be quite small and almost pinpoint on this diagram. And this major vestibular gland has really this one component of the asini that are mucin, mucus secreting columnar cells. So this is the component that you're looking for for the Bartholin's gland. But then the second component is really the duct of the Bartholin's gland. And that is this uh, dilated area that can show all different sorts of squamous, transitional, mucinous, ciliated, flattened or really non-specific epithelial lining. So you can see that transition point here. So when we have a duct that can have an obstruction in the orifice, the secretions will fill this cyst and it can um, secondarily have a superimposed chronic and acute inflammation. So the Bartholin's gland cyst, which is very common that show, presents as a lateral uh, introidal swelling, is, can sometimes be asymptomatic, but can also present with a mass effect, as you can see and visualize here, or with dyspareunia, and really results in surgical excision. So when you get these types of specimens, it can be quite um, piecemeal because the acute and chronic inflammation, as you can see, that's going very deep into the tissue can make it rather fragile. And so it, it'll come in different pieces. And you're seeing this non-specific epithelial layer here, and then you're seeing the acute and chronic inflammation and you're like, well, done and dusted, that's my job. And, but you really have to think about not just the abscess, but think about looking for that Bartholin's gland. So it can be kind of a bit of a treasure hunt to find where that Bartholin's gland is so that you're saying, and I mean, there's going to be clues to where it is in the clinical history, but to say a Bartholin's gland cyst, you want to be able to at least identify the Bartholin's gland. Um, with the nonspecific epithelium, the, the malignant counterpart of this really is the Bartholin's gland carcinoma, which is something that is pretty darn rare. And there is a diagnostic criteria for uh, Bartholin's gland carcinoma that involves the area of the Bartholin's gland and um, definition as histologically compatible with origin from the Bartholin's gland and this transition from normal uh, elements to epithelial to neoplastic ones, but there's no evidence of primary tumor elsewhere. But I'm going to go back and say, well, you have this lining that can be somewhat promiscuous. And so you can arise at a number of different neoplastic uh, carcinomas, like histotypes, 
based on what you had beforehand. And so there's even some reports of adenoid cystic carcinoma in that area. So that's something to um, be cognizant of. So, but that's not going to be the second most common um, pathology that occurs in the Bartholin's gland, because really what ends up happening is that you have an enlargement and most of the time it's going to be a cyst, but sometimes I want to, uh, it's going to be nodular hyperplasia. And I just wanted to take you through what that looks like. And if we can remember what the definition of hyperplasia is from medical school is that it's an increase in the number, whereas hypertrophy is the increase in the size. And so this nodular hyper hyperplasia is this kind of solid unencapsulated growth that has a proliferation that maintains the duct and asinar relationship of the Bartholin's gland and distinct from an ad that maintaining relationship of the duct and the asini here. They have said outer side of labia majora or inner side of labia majora. So that's what I would just go with. Um, and so it, it's different up later. So any breast pathology can happen in the vulva. So you um, can take my word for it. You can see that not only is there an epithelial component, but there is this rimming here of myoepithelial cells surrounding. And there's a little bit of a transition here to some apocrine metaplasia. So probably the most common that uh, everyone knows um, of the anogenital memory, like glandular adenoma is hydradenoma papilliferum. So much so that we don't even call it a memory like glandular adenoma because we have a spot diagnosis for it. And this is probably the prototypical type of um, anogenital lesion. So it is one of these slow growing firm reddish nodules. And the, the weird thing about this one is, is that there is no clear correlate in the breast, um, but we all know what it looks like in the vulva. So we have a nice little uh, biopsy that this one is communicating with the surface, but it's welling, it's um, well demarcated and you have this number of well-organized papillary fronds. And going up on high power, you really see this characteristic African type cell with the decap decapitation and um, secretions. And I wouldn't go up too high power because you start to get worried by these central nucleoli and you just need to kind of go back and see how well-organized this is. But this is a spot diagnosis of hydradenoma papilliferum. And so like any other breast pathology, phylloides can also occur in the vulva. And this is an example of one that happened just below the um, vulvar epithelium. And you can see it's very uh, well demarcated. And this one was shelled out. And that there is that typical intraglandular uh, type of leaf-like structure. And this fiber epithelial a uh, benign neoplasm comprised of epithelium and the benign stroma that goes with it. So no atypia, no um, mitotic figures, no, uh, not even any really a lot of uh, periglandular cuffing. So again, we see that nice myoepithelial cell lining here. So this is where knowing about the anogenital memory-like tissue, knowing where it is, and then knowing about what it's comprised of can really help you as a pathologist because this can come just labeled unceremoniously as a lump on the labium magus. And if you're not thinking about it, then this can look like a very complex proliferation and you can start going down a malignant path really quickly. Looking on higher power, the things that are going to bring you back to the benignancy side is that these are low grade nuclei. These do not have, and when you're thinking about breast, you know how you get uh, the more malignant, the more rigidity you get in the breast. So you get not just, you get those punched out looks of the DCIS. This doesn't have that. It's still got that coral pattern. Um, and that there's no other high grade features in the uh, nuclei. And then if you can just let yourself take a brief look to see that this, there's these myoepithelial cells that are surrounding 
each one of these glandular units. And what ended up happening with this one is that there was a multitude of immunohistochemistry done on it. And this is also a cautionary tale of doing immunohistochemistry and knowing what it is that can be positive with the stain that you're using and that it can be positive for more than what you're thinking. So GATA3 was positive. Um, so, but it wasn't done on the first round. The GATA3 was done on review. Um, so I don't think it was picked up on the first round, but as you can see, it's, it's positive for GATA3 breast marker. So there was lots of other things that were done on the first round. And um, it was signed out as a vulvar adenocarcinoma, which isn't a, a real typical diagnosis that you would use. And then I think that it was picked up because they were trying to look for the primary or trying to look for an origin and um, they had done some curating. So this was pulled and reviewed. And two of the other immunohistochemistry stains that were done on it were CD10 and P63. And I think that they were done for two different reasons, maybe to pull out a squamous part of an adeno, adenosquamous, and then for CD10, maybe to um, think that this is some type of endometriosis. Um, but what you can't, what you have to remember is that both CD10 and P63 stain myoepithelial cells. So this pattern is very characteristic and would be very reassuring for a benign mammary gland uh, anogenital adenoma, which is what this ended up being. And so it's important to remember all the different options that you have in the vulva under anogenital mammary-like tissue. So that was just some of them. Now I'm gonna go on to a few different other things. Um, and I think it's the, the spordices, spots and granules. This has come up a few, times for me and it's come up in two different ways um either they are able to tell me exactly what something looks like clinically on the requisition and i get this kind of description of small slightly elevated yellowish or whitish papules or spots um or i get uh nothing and then i go back to them and i say oh, did this look like small, slightly elevated yellowish, whitish papules or spots? And they say, yes, yes, it did. So these four dice spots or granules are one of the places in the body that these can happen. And the other places are uh, like along the uh, border of the lip and or on the glands of the penis. And it really is just an ectopic sebaceous gland that lacks a pilosebaceous cyst. And like I said, that there's good clinical pathologic correlation. So this is what they can look like. And so you can imagine you get a little biopsy of it and you see these ectopic sebaceous glands and you can go back and you say to the clinician, oh, is this what it looks like? And they're, they're so happy that you figured it out. So you've got this little ectopic gland without a little hair bearing thing. I think that this is just an extension of a gland here. And that's a pretty cute little um, diagnosis to make. So some of the miscellaneous aspects that I couldn't really fit into a category uh, is verrucal xanthoma. So similar to Fordyce's granules or spots, this has a very characteristic look, only this can be very worrisome to the clinician because the acant, because of the um, hyperkeratosis, it can look very plaque-like and large and raised, and um, they can be thinking that it's way worse than what it is. So it's usually asymptomatic for the patient. And um, this, is, this is another one of those lesions that can occur not just in the oral or not just in the vulvar cavity, but also in the oral cavity. So this was given to me courtesy of my friend, Dr. Lin Huang, who I guess has also done a podcast lecture as well. And you can see what this, you can clinically kind of appreciate what this must have looked like on the patient's vulva and why it would have been a cause for concern. You have got a ton of hyperkeratosis, parakeratosis here. And it really is these elongation of red A ridges. And you think, oh my goodness, what could be inciting such a reaction? And you're getting higher power and you see that there is maturity along here that it does have some overlapping features for DVIN, but we are lacking any sort of atypia in the basal layer. 
And then you clue into looking into these areas between the papillary dermis and you see these xanthomatous foamy cells. And that is what is giving this such a reactionary look. So I just want to make sure that we look at all the features here because we did have hyperkeratosis, acanthosis, elongation of red ridges, the granular cell layer was absent, the, there was eosinophilic change. So all of those things you would see in like a verrucal type pathway or even a DVIN type pathway. But you're missing that basal atypia and you've got the presence of these foamy uh, laden macrophages. This one's a fun one. Um, this is from a 67 year old and she had a very well demarcated lesion on the vulva. It looks like it's got some rolled edges and it almost looks like there's a bit of an ulcer forming here. But I think that that could also be because she was treating it with apple cider vinegar every night. So it might look a little bit more angry than it um, probably would have been. It probably was a little bit more indolent before they were putting direct vinegar on the lesion. Um, but this is such a nice uh, clinical pathologic correlation. You can see again, that kind of shallow rolled edge here. And we have a well demarcated lesion going into the stroma with this overlying reaction. And this is another tumor that can occur not just in the vulva, uh, but you have these polygonal type cells with not really indistinct cell borders, and they've got these round nuclei that are fairly monomorphic looking. But the, the key histologic feature is that these are packed with that eosinophilic material. And you probably don't need any histo, uh, immunohistochemical stains to diagnose this, but just in case you would like some, this is S100 positive and CD68 positive. And this is a granular cell tumor that is a benign soft tissue neoplasm of neural origin. So this is something that happens in males more than, or females more than it does males as an asymptomatic mass. So that, that um, patient presentation, they probably weren't having any sort of complaints with it other than that it was there. And again, this can occur anywhere in the body, but 15% are located in the vulva. And the highest incidence is around that fourth and fifth decade. Another component that I want to discuss about this particular case is the pseudoepithelioma,tous hyperplasia over top. This is also something that can be very distracting, especially if there was an incisional biopsy, like I showed on the IHC, um, that would, like something like here, where if you weren't popped on to the what was happening in between the squamous layers that you would be going down another path of squamous cell carcinoma. And it was really just this florid reaction, this overlying squamous reaction to the tumor underneath. So we're gonna talk about the last thing in um, the uh, kind of um, cutaneous adnexal area, which is the extra mammary Paget's disease. And this is an intraepidermal adenocarcinoma and it can be in any region outside of the breast, but um, anogenital is the most common. Other sites that are common are like the eyelid and the ear, which is kind of interesting. But this malignant in situ lesion of cutaneous sweat glands is uh, the majority of the diseases, the type of disease that happens in the vulva for extra mammary pagets. And I think everybody knows that this underlying malignancy can present, but it is less than 25% of cases. And these are from other deep organs in the area, such as colon, bladder, and cervix. Here's the surgical, surgical excision of extra mammary pagets, where you can see it's inciting a very uh, florid uh, lichenoid reaction to it. And even at this low power, you can appreciate on the ba basal and parabasal la layer, some pagetoid type of spread of these clearing-like uh, cells and that some of them have this voluminous type of pale pink cytoplasm. And here it's really well illustrated without having all of the inflammation surrounding it. Some areas can uh, only be right along the basal part, like right here, where you would have to 
um, be very cautious at looking and seeing that you would see some of this pagetoid spread up. And then other areas that can be quite striking. So here is a really good place to get the histology of the um, pretty low grade nuclei, but really what sells it is that pale pink voluminous cytoplasm and then that uh, epidermotropic type of movement of the cells. So it really does involve the epithelium and some of the related adnexal structures, and they can occur as, as I've shown in those isolated cells and nests in the basal and parabasal epithelial layers. You do have to think about some other differentials at the time. So toker cell hyperplasia, melanoma, and then an underlying malignancy as we've stated. So this is where some ancillary testing can help you. And hope to use not too many stains because this is something that um, based on probably uh, histology and what the clinical presentation is, is that you probably won't need too many. And there's lots of different ways that you can do this. So this isn't kind of a um, standardized list, like whatever it is that you're able to do, you can kind of get into the ballpark and then there's no one way to diagnose uh, extra mammary pagets on IHC. But if you have seven and 20 and you can pull that out, then you can definitely kind of um, eliminate bladder and colon as some of your uh, differentials. And then you're left with possibly a cervical cancer. And the GATA3 here should point you in the right direction, or you can use a HER2. Um, if you have if you have GATA3 and CDX2, then you can differentiate between the bladder, which will be GATA3 positive, and the colon, which will be CDX2 positive. But if you don't have any immunohistochemical stains and you do have something that can, because th these are, um, these have neutral mucins in them, neutral and acidic mucins, they'll stain with anything like Alshin Blue, PAS, Mucicarmine. You can pick out some of this intraglandular, uh, intracellular deposit here. So that was an example with PAS. And then you can see how nice the CK7 will highlight uh, those single cells and um, their trip upwards. HER2 is a nice one too with that uh, membrane, um, with the rimming around the cell. And then you can see the extension down into the adnexal structure here. And I didn't talk about MCEA, but this one had it. So I thought I would show it just to say that there's lots of things that can be positive. So you take what you have in your lab and, and work out what um, you can do. But if you're going to, if you have melanoma as a differential and you're going to be using immunohistochemistry to try and, um, prove that it's not melanoma, then it's good to know what sort of these stains look like as a negative too, because there are melanocytes around that area. So it's good to see that there is some staining as a negative. And then the same with S100, this can even look more so like it's staining, but it's not staining those voluminous uh, pale pink cells. So surgical resection is the um, mainstay of treatment. And they do like to have a margin, but recurrences can occur even with a negative margin due to this multifocal field effect. The prognosis is pretty good. I have seen um, some that have invaded and they're, they're, they're still doing, this is anecdotal, they're still doing okay, but uh, the prognosis is meant to be less so even with one millimeter of invasion. So we're gonna leave that area of kind of cutaneous adnexal lesions and we're gonna move into the pigmented area. And I think that when people, at least clinicians think of pigmented lesions on the vulva, their number one go-to is melanoma. And what I just wanted to highlight here for the next few minutes is that there are a number of other different diagnoses that can be made other than melanoma and that there are a number of different reasons why something can be pigmented in the vulva and not it and it not be due to melanin either. So the first case we're going to go through is a 67 year old who had an itchy gray silver patch on the vulva. And so I guess that 
this, um, so, and query psoriasis. So one thing to mention is, I know that this is a squamous lesion, but I wanted to show it because of the pigment incontinence and because of the uh, pigmented description in the clinical diagnosis. And I think that this is a great case to also talk about things that happen in the vulva and the integumentary folds. So this can be um, something that has an inverse type of presentation. Uh, so the psoriasis doesn't really look red. It kind of looks like that gray color. And if you can see here that this isn't psoriasis, but what we have here is we saw two red A ridges and we have this really uh, brisk in interface dermatitis. And then we have this pigment here. So what do we think that this is? So it's dermal melanophages that are this pigment incontinence into the dermis. And when we start looking um, at some of the other features such as the wedge-shaped granulosis and the savat bodies, then we come up with this lichen planus pigmentosus inversus, which is a rare variant of lichen planus pigmentosus. I've looked at some of the other PathCast lectures and I do find that people go through a range of like very common stuff. So I wanted to give you guys some rare birds as well. Um, so this is something that affects the sun protected areas, which is only very rarely reported in this area. And that is occasionally associated with lichen sclerosis. So one of the pigmentations that you can get can be due to dermal melanophages. This can also occur in some um, post-inflammatory pigment loss into the dermis. So there's been like some other type of squamous lesion that there's been some scratching at and it's caused some pigment uh, incontinence into the dermis. And you can see that post-inflammatory post pigment incontinence that causes a hyperpigmentation. So 77 year old lifelong lesion of a dark spot on the vulva. So I, I'm not sure what the inciting event was that the 77 year old was like, I wanna know what this is, but got it taken off. And here it is, it's a cute little biopsy and the overlying epithelium looks otherwise unremarkable. And here in the papillary dermis, you have these large ectatic vessels and going up onto higher power, you can see that this is an endothelial lining and that they have some red blood cells in them. And this is a little cavernous hemangioma. So in this case, the pigmentation was due to the, uh, the blood being up near the surface of the skin. So here's one 20 year old female, irregular shaped, small dark mole on labia minus, query melanoma. We're going right to melanoma here. So this was, um, now do I have, oh yeah, I do. Uh, so. I've got a little biopsy here. And again, you can see that we have these ectatic type of, you've got this ectasia that's in the dermis and it almost looks like from this power, is that blood or what is that? And then you get a look on higher power and you see that this lining is not an endothelial lining. In fact, this lining has some, what looks like apical snouts on it and they look pigmented and then this, all in the center looks pigmented. So this was a courtesy. Uh, this is courtesy of my colleague, Dr. Osmond, um, who's a dermatopathologist, and shared this case with me. And it's kind of a fascinating case that now we're getting this pigmented apocrine snout lesion, and this stain here is melan A. And so we have a pigmented apocrine hamartoma of the vulva, which these like African cells are kind of colonized by these dendritic melanocytes. So just fascinating. But this is the other reason why you can have pigment is that there was melanin, but it was colonizing the African cells and, um, and, and kind of dilating them out due to the secretions. So then going in, so that was some of the reasons why you can have like non -melan melanocytic lesions, but now we're gonna get into some things and we're even gonna step up to the melanoma. So first, a melanotic macule, this is really a pigmented patch on the mucosa, but because it can look asymmetrical, there is sometimes cause for clinical concern. 
And so like this woman who is 55 and she had a pigmented lesion, but she had a previous H cell. So women who have previous H cells have lots of people looking down at their vulva a lot more often than most folks going on about their life. And so when you see a pigmented lesion and you've already had a previous H cell, it's cause for concern and this one got biopsied. And so what do we see with this lesion? Well, we have pigmentation, that's for sure. We have a slight acanthosis just right here, just a thickening, but there's no increase in melanocytes. Well, that is the definition of a macule. So um, this, this woman is, has no particular follow-up, is free and clear, and this is just a pigmented patch on the vulva. And then just to talk about melanotic nevi of genital type, it's pretty uncommon for women to have nevi, but two to 3% can have um, a nevi of genital type on their ex, uh, external genitalia. And these are important to know about because they can have some different features, which due to the location and trauma and rubbing can be important to recognize at these special sites. So we have something that looks very ex, um, exophytic here. I always struggle. I never know if I should do these talks with my slide scanner, which now has produced this overexposed type of pink one. So I redid it on my microscope camera, but sometimes it blurs at the edges. It's like the wonderful world of publicly funded healthcare. You can never get it quite right. Um, so we have this exophytic lesion here that you can think they might've thought was a skin tag because it kind of has that wrinkled look. But then when you are looking, you can clearly see that there's something in the stroma here and even just this look of the pigment. So it's a primarily um, intradermal type of component and these are very small and they do have um, all of the features that you would normally have for place it, for a nevi that would be at another site other than a genital site. Uh, but you can imagine that like, this looks like it's going quite deep down. So you would be concerned about that. But then again, you would remember that this is a special site and that there's no other high risk features here. So then we're going to dive right into vulvar melanoma. And I think everybody knows that this is a malignant melanocytic neoplasm that arises in the external genitalia. And there's gonna be some disconnects a little bit when talking about vulvar melanoma because it can occur on either the hair bearing skin or the mucosa. So when you take it out of the region of the vulva, those are two different melanomas and they are described and staged somewhat differently. So when you lump them all in together because of the site, it makes things a little bit confusing. However, uh, vulvar melanomas are 3% of all melanomas, but there is a cutaneous skin to vulvar ratio of like 71 to one. So it's pretty rare. The patient demographics is that these patients are usually older than patients with melanomas in sun exposed areas. So we're talking about the sixth and seventh decades. They're mostly Caucasian women and there's a late presentation due to various reasons. Mucosal melanomas present late just because of the nature of mucosal melanomas, but also there can be a lot of other barriers associated with melanomas of the vulva, including just the embarrassment of having something down there that they don't wanna talk about. The anatomy affected is um, the majority are in the clitoris and then the next most common is the labia majora followed by the labia minora. And the gross description of these can really range from being pigmented or flat or polypoid. So the microscopic findings are histologically similar to an ac acral lentiginous melanoma. So the school of thought of like acral melanomas are that they're basically mucosal, but not at a mucosal site. So we've already talked about how some of these are mucosal, but not all are mucosal. I find it so confusing because it's like, just let's pick one thing and talk about it. And what we seem to be like combining a lot of these Venn diagrams. So 
melanomas at a vulvar site can be mucosal for the most common, or they can be superficial spreading. And then the least common is nodular. So the mucosal for microscopic findings, they have very similar to what you've seen, this like diffuse proliferation of large epithelioid cells and nest along the basal layer with pagetoid spread that's common. Nodular melanomas lack that radial growth phase and ulceration is common. So let's have a look at a melanoma. You can see here that the skin here, this is a nodular melanoma. And you can see, like, I mean, it's obvious that this is a nodular melanoma and that the um, epithelium here is just otherwise eaten away or gone. And you have this large growth. And I'm going to show you what these different patterns looked like in different areas. I don't remember if this patient, if they thought was melanoma at the start, I actually don't think that they were questioning melanoma. I think that they might've thought it was a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, so there's, there was a number of patterns here. So you have this almost looking like a glandular pattern. It's very serpentine-like. And then you have more of the spindle-like pattern. And thankfully there was some pigment in here. So the main predictors uh, for vulvar melanoma is a histologic predictor of tumor thickness, so Breslow's, which you measure from the top of the granular cell layer. But we've already said that like lots of these can be mucosal and so there is no granular cell layer. So then you, I guess you can measure it from the bottom of the ulceration base, but that also doesn't always help or happen. So there, in my mind, there's like not really a lot of standardization with a main histologic predictor where you can't measure it the same in every um, melanoma in that area. So it's important to remember that the features reported in uh, vulvar melanomas are similar to the cutaneous ones. So if there is an ulceration like there was in that nodular melanoma, then that's important to mention. And if you have mitotic figures, as we do here and here, that those are important to mention as well too in your synoptic report. And just to show you some of the immunohistochemistry and how things that are melanocytic and incision, incisionally biopsied can be rather difficult. Uh, so the melanase, yep, stays, stains real strong and so does the SOX10. But the HMB45 in pattern one, which was more that that glandular type of pattern, you can see that it's strong in some areas and weaker in others. And in pattern two, that spindled area, it's almost absent. So if you only had like this part, you might not be thinking that this was positive. And depending on what other stains that you did, you might have been led down another path. Same with the S100, it was quite variable and uh, localized as to where it was positive. So if you only had a, an incisional biopsy, then it would be very difficult because you'd be getting maybe like an S100 HMB45 negative. And like if only if you had the luxury of having um, these other two melanocytic markers, so doing all four melanocytic markers, that you would have uh, a clear uh, immuno, immunophenotype just to show you that the pancaritin was negative in this case. Molecular mu mutations are interesting in vulvar melanoma. We do see that there is some CKIT or NRAS mutations, BRAF mutations, but NRAS is the most uncommon in sun exposed skin. So, um, so like I've mentioned about the issues with the vulvar melanoma staging, the location, it kind of lends itself to more than one classification re resulting in the staging ambiguity where there is no consensus in staging. And it seems like the most correlative with survival is Breslow's, um, but it's difficult if it's mucosa. So there are other predictors of survival. I've already mentioned Breslow's, but um, a negative predictor of survival is increased age and also lymph node involvement. There is also no consensus on a sentinel lymph node protocol uh, for vulvar melanomas and then ulceration. But there's a number of other confounders that end up being with ulceration. So I think it under 
multivariate analysis it is, but univariate, uh, it doesn't show up as a predictor. To tell you the truth, like I ask for help on my vulvar melanomas. I don't see why anybody wouldn't ask for help. Um, I find that the terminology and the nomenclature a bit confusing. And so we're all trying to work through it together. I do think it could benefit from a little gyne path love where gyne paths are so good at being able to standardize between um, site and etiology as we've seen in the cervix and the vulva before for squamous lesions and in the ovary for ovarian, uh, epithelial ovarian cancers. So it could benefit maybe from getting some gyne path size on the vulvar melanoma world. And with that, I would like to thank you. Um, this is the hospital that I work at, the Saskatoon City Hospital. And you can, my office is just right over here. The lab gets to be this entire fifth floor. And um, I just wanna thank the creators of PathCast again for having me. And I'm happy at this point to take some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Kinlock, for this uh, excellent talk on uh... Um, so many different miscellaneous valor conditions, and I'm sure our viewers loved your talk. Uh, I'm looking online for questions. So one question I see is, do any of these non-squamous lesions have HPV association? So not to my thinking here, I'm just trying to think back on what I talked about and I'm not, none of it's really coming into mind with an HPV association. Sorry. All right, thank you. So the, another question is regarding the memory analog uh, lesions that you were talking about. Uh, do you have, do you have experience of dealing with uh, memory like uh, carcinomas in the vulvar area? Not really. Like we don't see, I haven't seen one in five years. So I don't like it's theoretically possible, right? And it's certainly theoretically possible if a woman, d depending on um, what stage they're at. So even if they're lactating, they can have lactational change in there as well too. So they can arise, a carcinoma can arise to it, but it's very uncommon and then you would go by what the histologic features are as the breast correlate but sorry i don't have a lot of experience right you showed one example of uh, what's it called a uh, vulvar phyllo tumor so mm -hmm. is there a different name for it or it's just called memory phyllo tumor <laughs> yeah i think it was just called like mammary um, phylloides tumor of the vulva. And then there was like a long comment and followed up by a phone call to the clinician. And so I, I know that pathologists end up talking um, as their primary form of communication is the written word. But in those types of situations, it's best to just have a phone call and to have a very plain language comment at the bottom. Um, we don't have to be so rigid with some of our language uh, to the point where we're not getting across what the, what the diagnosis uh, is to the clinician. Um, I, I, am, I am very one of these like learned OCD pathologists where you wanna follow the exact diagnostic criteria and the WHO, but at the same time, there has to be like a plain language type of communication with the clinician that is not a pathologist and that will be able to understand your report. Right. No, thank you. Because uh, when you mentioned about that phyllodes tumor, it reminded me of uh, one case that I saw some time back, uh, memory phyllodes tumor involving the valva. So we ended up awesome. it, and then I realized that, oh, it could have had different other names because uh, it's arising from those memory analog glands, not really those are, you know, memory glands, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then it's the same way with the hydronat, uh, hydradenoma papilliferum. It's like, well, that was just the cute name that it was given. It's probably not the right name that it needs to be. And you say that there is no breast analog for hydradenomas, right? 
That's just, that was my research. I don't know. I mean, like, I, I'm also not a breast pathologist. Maybe there's some breast pathologists in the crowd that could educate me. I'd be happy to hear what the breast correlate would be. Right, right. Thank you. And uh, so regarding your, there is, here's another question. The one thing that I think that's a pertinent uh, situation which we face um, more often in clinical practice, is it about the Paget's disease. So you nicely presented us, uh, you know, like close heart about how few immunostains can be helpful. And uh, so the question from a viewer is that, can you break it out, break it out again? What is your exact approach when you see a Paget's disease? Because when you get the slide, you don't know whether it is extra memory or it is like, you know, related to a malignancy, right? So you go- with, Right. Yeah, please. So part of it is going back and seeing what the clinical aspect is. So, but however, like, so it's gonna look like a scaly kind of erythematous lesion that is not well demarcated. And that can also lead you down a road of more likely from the clinician's perspective that they're probably thinking that it's maybe like a fungal lesion or some sort of atrophic vaginitis. So they've already tried things um, before they've got to you. So one of the things that you could add in there is maybe you're adding the PAS stain to make sure that there's no candida or some sort of superficial dermatophyte. Um, so when you're breaking it down from, is this melanoma versus sort of an extra deeper um, secondary malignancy, I think that like, there can be some overlap in the histology, but you really need to be looking at those nests or isolated cells in the basal or parabasal area with the, that voluminous type of cytoplasm that, and the central nuclei that is going up through. So the, if you don't have any other immunostains or if you're curious if this could be type of um, secondary malignancy, then you always do have to go back to the clinician and give that as an option. So if this is their only um, complaint and that there's no other, you're doing the, your review of symptoms and that there's no other like postcoital bleeding, postmenopausal bleeding, that there's no other um, GI symptoms or rectal bleeding, that there's no frank blood or hematuria, then it's probably unlikely that a tumor has progressed so much that it secondarily involves the vulva without them having symptoms of the other tumor first. And I think that that's probably the way that I would approach it from a very practical point of view, rather than um, trying to dig down into the immunohistochemistry even more. Thank you. But you will order a few immunos anyways, right? Like, I mean, a basic panel, at least CK720, right? And then uh, get a tree hard to, will you or no? Yeah, sometimes I do. Yeah, I think that there's there's not a standardized way in our department, the way that we handle it. So I think people have, based on where their training has been, that they order CK720 to start. And then they have kind of their favorite one that they would like to order. So some people um, like to order the intracytoplasmic, so the mucicarmine. Um, I like to do the HER2 and the GATA. And then there's other people that like to do the MCEA. So we just kind of go with, we learn from each other and go with what everybody um, has the, as their preference. Thank you. Uh, I think you can keep your slides shared because now there's... Oh. It's very dark, like because you're. Oh my goodness! Sure. There is a no. It's okay. So there is another question. Uh, what's your? Yeah, perfect. I think it's fine. The next question is, uh, what's your experience with anogenital Crohn's disease without colonic involvement? Oh my God, zero. I don't know. <laughs> you guys have crazy questions. <laughs> I don't know if I've come across that. Anogenital Crohn's disease without colonic involvement. Okay, then like, uh, uh, what are the common infectious 
conditions that you see in that region, such as uh, STIs, et cetera? Yeah, so syphilis is really making a comeback, um, especially somehow in the pandemic. Um, so we have seen an increase in syphilis in our lab and pretty much anybody that comes in with a inflammatory sort of looking vulva where you can see a plasma cell, we will do our um, spirochete IHC. The last one that we had was a 23 year old and she had an ulcer, um, she had an ulcer for a 23 year old on her vulva and they didn't know what it was from. And so that was very satisfying to be able to say, but syphilis is definitely one of them. Um, one of the other ones that we have seen is definitely dermatophytes. So you have a candidia, candidiatal uh, infection and um, PAS or PA, PASD or PASF or even GMSF is useful in those situations. Um, some of the things that we look for in those ones. So I will say that we do at least one stain for all the vulvar lesions that have an inflammatory component for the candida because it's always going to be the one that you don't do that extra stain that it's you're going to miss it. But some of the things that will help um, point you in that direction is some parakeratosis or some neutrophils that, uh, and that kind of overlaps with a psoriasis diagnosis, I guess. But those are the two big ones that we see. Um, I guess the candida isn't really an STI, but um, we just had a, and then a herpes just came through and those are like pretty classic on histology. I'm sure that everybody's seen the three M's before. Oh, that's interesting to know that uh, you mentioned about the comeback for syphilis. I think even in the GI world, uh, we have heard that, uh, that, that there is a, a the syphilis, there is increased incidence of syphilis uh, in the anal area as well. So, yeah, we've got a big campaign going on that you you need to mask in the streets and mask in the sheets. That's their new yeah. slogan to combat right. syphilis. Right, right. Yeah, like, I mean, I think that's a matter of concern for sure. So I think there's another question that I see about melanoma that you mentioned. Um, is there a difference in the staining for melanomas in uh, vulvar area between S100, HMB45, or MART1, or things like that? Or like... Right you will prefer one marker over the other or how do you approach? So, so I don't, there's not a difference in staining. There is a heterogeneity amongst melanomas, regardless of the location of what their immunohistochemical staining patterns will be. And I think as we've come to appreciate is that there's no predicting which melanoma marker will stain um, the melanoma. I, I believe that SOX10 is the most reliable one. So as to say that it's the most sensitive specific one. Um, however, it can be that only one of these melanoma markers stains or any pattern of melanoma markers will stain. So the recommendation, um, if you have something that is very poorly differentiated and you are unclear as to what the lineage is, and your first panel of immunomarkers that included one or two of these melanoma stains was negative and you have nothing else to try to lead you down another pathway that it is the recommendation to complete the other melanoma panel IHC that you have to try and pull one of those out. Um, we've seen it a number of times now and like I, again, as a gynae pathologist, I am still learning this very large area of melanoma that just happens to be on the vulva. And some of the differences that happen because of the location, but the pathology of the disease seems to be fairly conserved based on it being in the vulva or at the extragenital sites. 
Oh, thanks a lot. I think I might have missed it. Just a question that came to my mind. So what's your experience about the glandular malignancies in the vulva, which are also non-squamous, right? Yeah, so we've had a, like, so not a lot, like they're very few and far between. And um, I, I don't know that I've had too much experience of the glandular type of melano or glandular type of lesions in the vulva to tell you the truth. There's something to be said about like following the literature on them, but I, I don't have, they don't come across my desk very often. Sorry. Oh, mm -hmm. Okay. No, not a problem. Thank you. And do you have any, any experience about uh, metastatic lesions that can occur in the vulva? Um, well, we've had a few, but um, none that really like I would caution as a practice pearl or anything that hasn't been very um, that would be very useful for the listeners. Right, right, right. Uh, I think uh, I'm just looking online if there are some more questions from the viewers, but there are a lot of um, um, complimentary messages from the viewers, of course. Um, I'm just trying to find if there is a, oh, any more question. Probably no. So, I mean, I think with that, uh, we have come to the end of your talk. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Kinlock, for this excellent talk. And uh, you have covered so many different aspects of the uh, non squamous lesions of the vulva. And you would be happy to hear that you had so many viewers from across the world <laughs> who actually defied time zone and listened to your lecture. Let me read out a few of them. Of course, you had viewers from Canada. So Adnan Zain, he said that uh, uh, it's great to see people from other parts of the world or all over the world. Then uh, there were viewers from Ukraine, Egypt, uh, London, then Ghana, Nicaragua, Bangladesh, uh, India, of course, Pakistan, Romania, um, Finland, uh, I saw someone joining from Thailand also, Indonesia, a uh, lot of viewers from across the world. There was uh, another person who joined from Namibia. Then we had people from Peru, Antigua. So we had a lot of uh, viewers who listened to the lectures and thanks to all of our viewers for your support. We really appreciate it. And if you, like our lectures, so definitely please subscribe to our YouTube channel that is Patricast, and please subscribe or like and follow our Facebook page that is also Patricast, so that you can stay updated. We also have a newsletter, so you can subscribe to the newsletter. And our website is pathologicast.com, where you can get all the lectures. And in fact, the GYN pet lectures, you can access them separately. We had uh, 13 lectures so far and a lot more coming up. So you can have them in their website. Again, that's pathologicast.com. So our next lecture is on May 18th. That would be a heme pet lecture. And we will have Dr. Eve Crane back. And she will be presenting on large B cell lymphomas. That would be an algorithmic approach to large B cell lymphomas. So that would be at 9 a.m. Eastern time. So hope to see you all again. And thank you again, Dr. Kinlock, for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Bye to everyone. Yeah.